my final instructions before I left the pew, my wife said, remember, you've got to stay within that camera. Because <laughs> in the past, she'll say, we didn't see you half the time the other year when I was here. And so I'd move. And I tend to move a lot and get animated a little bit. So I move my hands and stuff gets out of the screen. So thank you. Oh, i got to do that too. Yeah, that's it. How's that? That agree. You may ask me to turn it off later, but that's okay. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank Perry for asking me to come <clears throat> and fill in for Dez. As you know, I'm the substitute. And in school, we always took advantage of the substitute when they came. So hopefully you'll go easy on me today. But I do appreciate it, and I appreciate this church. I appreciate <laughs> the saints of this church and putting this conference on. It has been a blessing over the years to me, and I'm very appreciative. I appreciate all the brethren that come and stand and speak. I learned so much from you. You just don't, oh, you just don't know how it's helped me to be strengthened. Right. When we first got right to vision down here, I was like, well, who do you go to? There's nobody anywhere. And I hadn't heard of all the grace believers that were up around the Chicago area, crossing the Pennsylvania, et cetera, because they had a pretty good group going on. And then you had John Staten on the West Coast. So I'm, I'm very appreciative that I got to know this group of people and it's helped strengthen me and helped me to see things that, you know, quicker, I guess. Over time and studying, I, I, I've gained a lot. But being around the brethren, fellowshipping, <clears throat> Bible studies, has been fantastic. You would turn to Philippians. I would do something funny, but that's Perry's thing and Richard's. I do it in my own church sometimes, but uh, they look at me as that those are old dad jokes, so that doesn't work well either. All right, Philippians chapter 2. The topic I've been given is God working in the believer. And it's going to be a fairly simple message. I hope that you gain something from it, because sometimes we need to go back and just remember some of the basic stuff. That helps strengthen us. In our world today, you need to understand the Word of God. You need to get rooted and grounded. Because even within, and I'll call it this, and don't beat me up for it, in our own ranks, if you will, in the grace groups that surround the country, many of those are sliding and moving away from right division. I don't know how many of you go online. The only reason I go online is just to see what the arguments are. I don't spend a lot of time... Well, I don't spend any time actually debating them online because that's sound bites. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to help us. All it does is cause more confusion. I appreciate uh, Brother Brian Ross, Dave Reed, who, and then Richard puts out, has been putting out material for years that discuss those but actually have a full Bible study around it so that you understand what the truth is. So I just pray today that you would gain something from what we're going to go over. Understand that God did something for us. And he has a greater purpose. And we're going to look at that today. In Philippians chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 12, he says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And there's some people will say, well, there you go. We just make up our own and work it out. Well, that's not what he's talking. In the next verse, he says, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the opportunity to speak at any time. But our prayer is that, that it isn't me. It's the words on the page and that each one in here will look at the Word of God, follow the passages, go back and study them so that they can be persuaded in their own mind. We thank you again for this opportunity, for each one that's here, for each one that's been here. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to do a little something, and there's a reason for it. This has been a tough year for us, and I'm not going to go into 
total detail, but these passages that I'm going to go over and the reason, the first message I preached of the new year was the brevity of life. And we all know that. Or we all think we know that. And we don't understand that, yes, I lost a mom and a dad, and some of you have done the same, and other uncles and aunts. But you just don't think it's going to hit home, even though you're preaching it, and you know it, and you know it's true. What happened then was, after the first year, the very next day, my middle son, we lost him. He found him dead in his kitchen. And he had, when we finally got the autopsy back, he has a lot of issues with his heart and stuff. But we're not going to go into all that. I just want you to understand. I want you to know what it means to be saved. Please. I, I don't know. I hope everybody in the room is saved. I hope there isn't a soul in here that isn't absolutely certain. And you can be. But when we talk about salvation in the world today, when you're out discussing it with individuals, what are they telling you? If you look at them and say, if you're going to die today, where would you go? And they, most of them will say, I hope to heaven. That's the normal response I give. I hope I'm going to heaven. The follow-up question is, well, what did you do, or how do you know? What gives you any assurance whatsoever? What is it that's getting you to heaven? And then they come. Well, I'm trying to be a better person. I'm trying to work, you know, for God. I try to read more in the Bible. So there's all kinds of things. Others say, well, if you're a Calvinist, <laughs> I was one of the chosen. You just sort of pull that out. I'm not sure how you know that, but you just say, I'm one of the chosen. Because I have a friend of mine now that I did not know this, that I've shared many things, has come out online now and pointed out, actually listed the five-point Calvinism stance and said, this is what I believe. So I'll be getting back in touch. Amen. But it's, it's scary what people, and then we have brethren that have slid over to the point of believing in universalism. Everybody's going to make it, no matter what. And they use it to try to prove that what we teach, if we teach there's a hell and eternal fire, then we're saying that God lost. Because now we're saying 95%, these are the figures that were given to me, 95% of the world is going to hell. And so God got tricked by the devil and beat him. You need to know what the Bible actually says. And so whenever I tell somebody, one of the simplest things is the Philippian jailer, when he came in, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so Paul started listing the things that he was going to need to do. He's going to have to start reading his Bible. He needs to go to church. He needs to not put innocent people in prison. You know, lots of things. You've been dipping or smoking or drinking. You need to, you know, cut, curtail all of that. He didn't tell him that. He said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now, all of us can quote that there's anything about our Bible, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, right? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Come on. It is the gift of God, not of works, that any man should boast. Well, we're going to, we're going to get into that problem <laughs> number 10. But 289 says it's for by grace through faith. So we know the method that it's going to happen. We also know that Christ died on the cross. He was buried and he rose again the third day. We're going to look at that in just a minute. But he shed his blood. Now, there's a teaching, and you may believe this, that's out there that when Christ died on the cross, all your sins, whether you're lost or not, were forgiven, taken care of. And you may end up in hell one day, 
forgiven from all your sins, but too bad. If you would, turn with me to Ephesians 1. In the book of Ephesians, you know, people always when they ask me, they say, what's, you got formulas, you got methods, well, how did it happen, or what do you need to do, etc. Well, here he tells you, he says in verse 13, in whom you also trusted that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. All right? So we see that. And people have got to hear what the word of truth, remember it says it's through faith. How do we get faith? Over in Romans 10, 17, he says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you have to hear the truth, but he says the gospel of your salvation. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. So are we what are we talking about here? The gospel, right? That's what he says. By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. That's a stumbling block for some folks. That's a question mark. So if I lose my memory... My salvation's gone. Is that it? No. Have you ever told someone that you're talking to and all of a sudden they're telling you something different than you told them? You said, do you remember what I told you? Do, do you remember what I said? Now, we'll look at this a little further, but he goes on to say, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. Okay, so it's Paul and he's telling them about something that he received, this gospel. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now this is basic stuff. That's what I told you. It's basic stuff, but it's absolutely essential to my whole message. God working in the believer. Because I have no message if I don't have any believers in the room. I need people to be saved before the rest of the message really helps you. So that's what we're going over. We, we need you to be sure. We don't want you tomorrow to discover you've lost someone that you never took the time to tell them how to get saved. It was sort of a wake-up call. It's a charge. Go out. Make sure when we leave here that you talk to those loved ones, those acquaintances. There's people in your life at your work, at your where you go do activities, whatever it is, that need to hear the truth. They need to hear the gospel. And only you can reach them, probably, because there's probably not many other people that believe grace like you do. That's going to talk to them. So keep that in mind. So then we look back at the verse that's sort of a stumbling block, and people said that in, in verse 2, he says, if you, were, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. How many of you believe that you believed in vain? Now, for when I was younger and somebody hit me with this, I didn't know what to do. But one of the things, because we have the Word of God and you've got to study the Word of God, you've got to take things in context. So let's read what the context is. Because can you believe in vain? Well, go on down to verse, and we won't go through all of this, but... 
Uh, come down to verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there's no resurrection of the dead? Now, in Paul's time, does anybody know, remember, was there any groups there that didn't believe in the resurrection? Any, the Sadducees, for sure. So there was, and that's why they were sad, you see. That's how I remember that. <laughs> But when you look at this, he said there is no, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, the logical conclusion is then Christ is not risen. Well, isn't that one of the anchor points to the fact of how we get, how the gospel is? If you're going to give them the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. If there's no resurrection, then Christ didn't raise. It doesn't matter if he died. He didn't raise. So if Christ be not risen, get what you hear, listen to what it says. This is how you take your Bible. It's not as hard. People try to make it, and you've got to read the Greek, and you've got to do all these things. A lot of times, just read the context. And it's amazing how things will clear up for you. And, you, and there'll be people here that are struggling with stuff that are afraid to talk to another believer, especially to a, a, a preacher or something. You, you, you get... You know, oh my gosh, that's Richard. I've had people tell me, that's Richard. I can't go up and say anything to him. I said, why can't you? He's just a guy. David's just a guy. These guys that have preached are just guys. We're, 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 we're not some speck. I know in the Independent Baptist Church I came out of, that was God's man and God's cult. And you can't, I understand, I've been there, where they were elevated up here on a pedestal. But he says, our preaching's vain, and your faith is vain. And yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. So there's a whole bunch of us that are just liars if Christ didn't raise from the dead. And all of you just sitting here listening to it and nod your head and say, yep, he did. But if, if this happened, if there is no resurrection, then everything we're doing is in vain. He says, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ. And that's what each one of you have been doing. I've heard Richard say it. I've heard David say it. I've heard many of you say it. Perry say it. Y'all keep telling everybody that he rose from the dead. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise, in case you didn't get that, Let's say it again. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sin. But that's not the case. And just understand, because all the worries in Thessalonians and talks about those that went on before us and what's going to happen to them, etc., he said, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. It's critical. The resurrection's absolutely critical. Because we're ever going to get to raise from the dead. We need this to be absolutely true. It says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Because most of us have rejoiced every single day because Christ raised from the dead. And we know what we have in him. So he says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. So he did. And thank God for that. And thus, we get the gospel. And if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, what he accomplished, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, guess what you can claim? I'm sealed. I'm saved. So now we're going to get into the a little bit the latter part here. Well, if you would first turn to Second uh, uh, Timothy one nine. Paul's talking to Timothy in his letter. And he says, "Who hath saved us?" 
and called us with a holy calling, not according to our work, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. How many of you think that it's fantastic that you're saved and not going to hell? Amen. Okay. Well, establish it. Maybe you're not excited, but I am. <laughs> I wake up just about every morning and I say, thank you. I, I still can't believe I was in a position that I could hear the truth. I, I just don't. You just look at your life sometime and you go, man, anything go wrong seems to go wrong. Here's one thing that went right. But this says that it's fantastic we got saved. And I mean, that's what we were looking for the, the night that I heard the truth and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what Richard just said, the other, that's the first time I think I actually heard your, heard you got saved, but I never heard the testimony that you gave the other night. And I sort of did what he did. I was in a pew and I heard the truth. And then they told me I had to come down. I got saved while I was standing in the pew. They had to come down there, I guess, tell me, you know. Yeah, and then, then you're right. And then later, when I was having trouble, because obviously we didn't get into the knowledge of the truth, which is the part I needed to get to next. I got saved, but then didn't get into the knowledge of the truth. And how that affected me, and some of you may experience the same thing, is that I would go home sometimes after church after having some fiery creature come through telling you're supposed to remember the day, the time, and what you said, and everything. And I'm like, oh, Lord, I don't know I remember all that. Did I say it right? It was, was, I, was I repenting enough? Was I, you know, I had one friend of mine that he used to stand up and brag. He says, I know I got saved because I was there when it happened. And I said, well, okay. It's hard to argue with. <laughs> but... I come down one time and an evangelist came through and I went down front and I was having doubts. And I just want I wanted assurance. I go home after church and I say, God, I don't say make me see that I'm lost and go to hell so I can trust you and get saved. <laughs> it was just foolish stuff that I did, but I didn't I didn't have assurance at the point. Because what I was being taught was different. I come down one time, the preacher said, Johnny, what are you here for? I said, that's one of them saved. He said, aren't you going to church here? Didn't you hear the church? The preacher here, he's a, he's a man of God. He said, you're saved. Don't worry about that. It's like, well, <laughs> so how did I get assurance? I got in here and I started reading the passages, and he just told me I had to believe, and it was all in Christ. There was nothing, no works that I did or could do or didn't do, and I didn't have to say certain words, and I didn't have to pray. I didn't have to do any of those things. I just had to believe. And from that point on, I never had any more doubts, but it came from here. Not because of being part of some particular group. All right. So let's go over to Ephesians chapter 1. Because right here in chapter, in, in Timothy, it said, um, well, we read here, 2 Timothy 1, 9, who hath saved us, called us the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. I didn't do it, and I didn't get, to, I couldn't save me. If you can't save you, then that means God had to perform something and do something for me that I couldn't do for myself. And yet he said here, it was according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So let's look back to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. When you got saved, 
God began to work in you. And he gave us a whole bunch of stuff. There's a whole lot of things happened when we got saved. And I, I don't have time to go over all of them, but I just want to touch on a couple. What was our problem before we got saved? Who were we in? Adam. Adam. That's a problem. Why? Because that's why we're a sinner. That's what got passed on all the way down. We have a sin nature. It's after the flesh, and the flesh is enmity with God. So if that's all true, then it seems to me, this is just me thinking, that to get out of Adam, Christ seems the right thing to do. Because what does the Bible say? In Adam, all die. And I was looking at the beauty of eternal life. Not death. So in Adam, all die. But in Christ, all are made alive. Now a lot of people go in and use that as the universalism, one of their texts. And they, they totally miss. And I'm going to tell you, do a study on in Christ or in him. That is critical to understanding a lot. That clears up a ton of issues. Because God's plan from before, from the, before the world began was it's going to be whoever's in his son, then all these things will transpire. Then you're predestinated. You're not predestinated for God to pick you. That's what Calvinism wants to believe. He didn't say that. It's in Christ that's the key. You've got to get in Christ. And so what happened was we were in the flesh. We were in Adam. And the first thing, well, I don't know if it's the first thing. I just know it sort of happened simultaneous. Go to Colossians chapter 2. We're coming back to Ephesians. But I want, I, I, I want to cover this and we'll come back. Colossians chapter 2. We, we love to talk about, and, and, and rightly so, verse 9, for in him dwells all the fullness of the, body, uh, the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. There's that in him. In verse 10, which is the head of all prince, power, and power. Now here you go. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Now there's other circumcisions. There's definitely one we know about that on the eighth day a Hebrew son had to be what? Is it one made without hands or did they use hands? <laughs> so it was the cutting away of the flesh. Well, we're circumcised. Here he says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Right? So within Christ, now an operation transpired the moment we believe, and we're circumcised. Then he goes on to say, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Now what's baptism? It's an identification, right? You're identified, you're identified in Christ and According to the scriptures in 1 uh, Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit. Now, this wasn't John the Baptist. How did John the Baptist, what was his agent? What did he use? Water. So when we come over to our baptism, a lot of people still want, you go everywhere. We were just at a funeral yesterday, and I saw the big old baptismal door, because they have big baptisms, and it's a big event, and you get invited to it and come watch the baptism of our child or whoever. 
But he says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. So that's something that transpired that God did in us. Then, what was our problem? Another problem that we had when Adam sinned, it says, in the day that thou sin, you're going to be killed, right? You'll be dead. Well, we'll right, go back and just read it. But what, how did he die? I know we began to die physically, spiritually. So look over in Ephesians. Chapter 2. It says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And what it means to be quickened? Made alive. We now have the ability to have a communion with God now. And the Bible says over in Romans 8 that it's his spirit, what? With our spirit. So that we can know. All right, let's go back to Ephesians. Uh, I mean, there's lots of other things. He forgave us all trespasses. He took care of the whole sin debt. That's where our forgiveness came. At that moment that we believe, he blots out the handwriting of ordinances. He seals us. He says that in Ephesians two, uh, one. He seals until the day of redemption. So we've got in us already, at the moment we get saved, and now he's got, we've got the Word of God, right? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. We have the Word of God. What was the Word of God for? Go over and look at what he's, he's given us. Go over to 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 3. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. That's sort of what the whole thing of the conference was. Right? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And what's it profitable for? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The purpose behind that, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good work. So if God's got to work for us, and you quoted it, go ahead and quote Ephesians 2.10. Oh, that created in Christ Jesus under good works which God before ordained that we There you go. So there is a purpose, right? Yes. That when we get saved, that God then did something for us. <clears throat> we were created under Christ Jesus, under good works. I mean, think of that. We've got all the tools. In 2 Timothy 3, we have the Word of God. We're not hearing visions. God's not speaking through us through visions. I'm not getting any revelations. It's all been revealed that I need to equip me to do what needs to be done and what God's purpose was for me and for the body of Christ. All right, let's, let's flip back over to Ephesians Chapter 1, continue. So he's blessed us in heavenly places, verse 4, according as he has chosen us to be in him. Is that what it says? No. In him. So hold your place there for just a second. Go over to... Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 4. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. He didn't, why didn't he just say, for you're all the children of God? We're all saved. He didn't say that. He said, you're children of God by faith where? In Christ Jesus. How do you get in Christ Jesus? You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's already made all the payments. There's nothing you can do. There's no words to utter. It's just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Oh, by the way, go to the book of Romans. I just thought of something because people, again, have this issue, and they try to throw this at you. Go over to uh, Romans chapter 4. They'll say, well, you believe that's a work. Don't tell me you didn't do something. You said you believe that's a work. Well, in Romans 4, verse 5, he says, But to him that worketh not but believeth on him, that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, I don't know whether to believe all the individuals that have made this stuff up. And, I mean, they've probably listened to the theologians. They've probably listened to, you know, the, the best Greek manuscripts and everything. But I think the Bible is the one I'm going to go with. And he said it's not a work. You choose who you want to believe. So Ephesians chapter 1. So he, he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world for what purpose? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Now predestination and all of it is not mentioned but a few times in the Bible. It's here in Ephesians. It's over in uh, Romans chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 8, let's flip over because I will probably misquote what I'm getting ready to read. Now, one verse I like in Romans chapter 8, I really like because it sort of plays out through what I'm getting ready to say. But this is not the verse we're going to look at. Romans 8, 28, and we know, we, all, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. See, he has a purpose. Remember, he saved us according to his purpose. Not according to my purpose, even though I got the blessings and the benefit of what he did and that I don't have to go to hell. And I get to spend an eternity and I get to be part of his program, etc. There's lots of reasons that's wonderful that we have it. But his purpose, he has a overlying purpose, if you will. So it says, court, court is perfect. Then verse 29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So at the point, what's our hope? We're looking for that blessed appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then what's going to, he said, to adoption to wit, the redemption of the body. Right? And we're going to have a body fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to Philippians. And so there we are. And he's already, we're predestinated to that. So that's a purpose. That's a big purpose of what he's having us, or going to do for us. Now look in Ephesians 1 again. He said, having predestinated us of the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now when we read that in Philippians... It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. In Philippians 1, uh, 6, he says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. How long are we sealed? To the day of redemption. The day of Christ. We're sealed up. We still have hope. You can't see, you have hope. If you can see, you don't need the hope, you don't need the faith, you know you, it's happened, it's there. All right, so back in Ephesians. According to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the blood. So he did everything. Again, we're not making ourselves accepted. He did it. In whom, verse 7, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us, in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Now, we know part of what his will, that all men be saved. Then he says, come to the knowledge of the truth. But let's read on. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed where? In himself. Now, guess what? If God's purpose is in himself, do you think that it's going to actually happen? We purpose a lot of things we're going to do, and they may or may not happen. 
But with God, his greater purpose, his overlying purpose, that doesn't depend on what dumb mistakes I make and the circumstances I get myself into, not going to alter what his purpose is that he purposed in himself. Richard was talking about last night, about uh, when Christ came, he's going to do some things alone. He's actually going to use Israel for some things, but then there's this stuff he's going to do himself alone. He's purposing things in himself that is going to transpire. He doesn't need my help or your help or anybody else's help. So he said that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, again, here we go. Let's see what some of that bigger purpose is. He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So you've got a big the overall purpose is that it's all going to roll up into one kingdom under Jesus Christ. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. That, that, that ought to make you happy. I mean, when I lost my parents, and, and, and with my son, first of the year, we had to do this probate, do all this stuff, and there was an inheritance. But those were inheritances that I, I didn't really want. <laughs> I mean, not saying I wasn't thankful that we had something to be able to take care of and make sure, you know, as far as the burial and all this, but that's not an inheritance I was looking for. I'd rather have them here, not that. But this inheritance, I'm excited about. Now, yes, it still costs the death. It costs Christ the death. We always say it's free, and our side of it is free, but it had a huge cost. The Lord Jesus Christ had to die. He buried and rose again. So here he said, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him that worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now be thankful for that, because that means, as Richard was talking about last night, with, with Islam and the Arab nation and the hatred they have toward Israel, They can't stop what God's will is. They think they can. Satan thought he could be like the most high. You see how that's working out for him. So I'm thankful this is all in the Lord. After the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Okay, he didn't mention the fact that because Johnny got out of hell. That was a piece that, sort of a side piece that I get and, and is amazing. But ultimately, that we should be to the praise of his glory. It's him. It's to the praise of his glory, and we get to be a part. Remember what Richard, those were here last night. I'm sorry, I'm going back. Some of you may not have been here. But I thought it was amazing, the Abrahamic covenant, and the fact that if Esau and group would have accepted that, accepted their position, they could have been a part of all this. But they, they didn't want that. They wanted to have the promise. They wanted that blessing. And so they've had a hatred for Israel. Well, guess what? How many of you think that Satan's thrilled with what God created in us and <laughs> that the heavens are going to be taken over? How do you think he's feeling? I mean, God, when God rose from the dead, when Jesus Christ came up from the dead, he said he... He, wrote, he did it triumphantly. I mean, he just made a big show. It wasn't, it wasn't like he did it quietly so nobody could see. They saw. Now, so that's our purpose. We want to know what God's working in us is, is going to glorify him, his son. Go over to Ephesians chapter 3. Here's the exciting part to me. is we get to be a part of this, In Ephesians chapter 3, we know this, that Paul, and, and it's been read, and I think David read some of this, and he talked about the mystery, he said, have by revelation, he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote a form a few words for about when you read. And by the way, that's the way to get it, when ye read. I tell my folks at church, give attendance to reading. There was long ago, Richard mentioned, and, and, and it should have just been common knowledge, but 
And sometimes you have to have somebody to hit you upside the head. He said, just start reading. Just start reading. Reading through the Bible. Reading through the Bible. And I've, I've learned so much from just doing that, not trying to get into anyone. And it's hard because sometimes I get off these rabbit trails. That seems interesting. And I want to take off and start studying on it. But just keep reading. And I take the time to try to read and just go through the Bible, just read it. And then you've got time to go study and then to meditate upon what you've been reading. But anyway, he's, how are you going to know this stuff? He said, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And that's how you're going to get the knowledge of the mystery of Christ, is reading it. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as is now revealed in his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs in the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel. If you can imagine in the Old Testament what exactly, how that would have went over. Gentiles just come in, sashaying in, so we just equal with you. They didn't have this to read. But he said, whereof I, am, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me whom less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So those are things you couldn't get in the Old Testament. They're unsearchable. So if you go find something and say, well, here, I think this, well, then you searched it and you found it. You can't find it. It's unsearchable. And so this was given to the Apostle Paul. That was that revelation that was given to him. Verse 9. And, and he, 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 Pay attention now. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Do we get that opportunity to go out and help all men see? And we got that because of what God started in us, and then we're to work out our own salvation and go out. And we get this opportunity to do this. To the end, and then he goes on, he says, uh, which from the beginning of the world have been hidden God who created all things but Jesus Christ, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Notice the next verse according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. What's the, what's the purpose? What, what did God start in us? How's God working in the believers to fulfill this purpose? So first you've got to know you're saved. Right? I mean, if you're not saved, all of this you just heard is not going to be worth anything to you when you walk out that door next week. But if you're saved, this could be transforming to just actually grasp. That you, one, you didn't have to do anything, but now God's allowing us to be a part of what he's doing. I've heard Richard say it often. I've heard others say it, but if you want, people trip up. You know, I've been praying. I want to pray for the will of God. Long ago, back at can. We, had, we rented a house, and there was an empty living room because we didn't have enough money to put furniture in it. I took a single chair because the preachers had said, if you go in to a dark place and close your eyes and just pray and then let God just fill you, he'll give you what you need. He'll give you your life verse. He'll give you this. So I had a Bible. I'm in the dark, and I'm supposed to flip through it and then just put my finger, and now God will guide me to my life verse. Say, you didn't do that. I said, well, yeah, I did. <laughs> and I, I fell asleep, <laughs> and I fell out on the floor, and I woke up. I said, this is ridiculous. <laughs> but I didn't know. I mean, I was, I was but a few months, or maybe a year old, a year and a half old in the Lord, and I, I had no clue. I was trying. I wanted to do the right thing. <laughs> and then one day I'm reading through it, it says, in all things, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Wow. It's just written down. And there's so much more we could go through to show what the will of God is in our lives and what, what, what we need about doing. So go out. And, and so what Richard said one day, and I, he was saying it to a group standing around asking him something. He said, well, here's what I tell people. Go find out what God's doing. And do that. I thought, well, that's simple. 
It makes sense. And because I'd read that verse, it popped in. It said, yeah. So I just went in and started looking. Well, what's God's will? What does God want me to do? What, what's he doing? And so I read 1 Timothy 2, 4. Who will have all men to be saved, come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay, so I've got a part in that. Make all men see what's the fellowship of the mystery. He said, be not conformed to this world, be transformed the renewing your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Hmm. Wow. So what's God doing in me? He's given me all the tools necessary to equip me to do what I need to do. My problem is, and most of our problems is, we don't go to where the source is. Paul tells us to be like-minded. And then earlier in that chapter, in chapter Philippians 2, he talks about the mind of Christ. I mean, he was equal with God, but he became a servant. He esteemed other better than self. And I thought, well, we should be able to do that because 1 Corinthians 2 says we have the mind of Christ. It's just that simple to go in. God didn't make it difficult for us to understand what he wants done. Our problem is we get in the way. There's a way that sinneth right unto man, the ends thereof are the ways of death. And usually anything that I think, mm, you know, if I do this and I figure this out and I do this, and normally it's, it, it's a catastrophe. And I want to close with this. I mentioned I lost our son. And I didn't know how I was, I always said, I don't, you never know how you're going to respond to those things. I read, Paul said, God said, my grace is sufficient. In his infirmities, his tribulations, his trials, my grace is sufficient. Scripture came to mind when I lost my son. With David, when he was crying out before his son, taken and died. And he got done. He got up and he told him to get him something to eat. Washed up. Went back to work. And he, his servants were watching. Why ain't you in mourning now? Which is what I thought. That, you know, I didn't know. I mean, I was having mourning inside. And he said, well, he can't come where I am. One day I'll go where he is. That's why I had a confession of faith. I say, man, I don't be looking like that. But right now, there's one. Six months later, we lost our youngest child. We lost third. You can go off the details, but I would go on. People ask, how do you get up and preach that funeral? How do you get up and go every day? But I have no answer for physically. I don't want to get out of bed. Grace of God. Grace of God. God puts, he gave us stuff. He equipped us to deal with it. I looked at it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll read that. We don't ever read through that. So that's talking about God comforting us. See, you can't really help people in certain areas if you've never been through it. So I'm used to when somebody, I had a friend of ours, lost a child. I don't know what they're going through. I honestly have no clue from this standpoint, which I, I, I can imagine, but I can't really know. I've never experienced that. And so then I think about when you're praying for patience. <laughs> and I said this in a, there's a men's group that I'm going to now that I'm getting an opportunity to speak at and give them the truth because they're coming in from all different groups and stuff. And I got up and one day I was talking about it because somebody said about patience. I said, well, just be careful what you pray for, you know. You know, we can talk amongst ourselves and others. I said, what do you mean? So it's tribulation, the word of patience, so you know. Uh, you want some patience, get ready for some treatment. Well, afterwards, one of the guys came up to me and said, Can I talk to you, brother? And I said, Be sure you talk to me. He said, I don't know that you did the right thing there by making that statement. 
what state you told me. He said, because you're discouraging people from praying. What do you mean? I just, it's what the scripture says. I said, go along with the Bible will show you. Tribulation work is patience. Right? Patience experience. Experience hope. Hope makes you not ashamed. I said, it's something that God's given us to be able to get through these trials and tribulations in this world. That we know it's working towards something. And it gives me the opportunity from 2 Corinthians 1 to be a comfort to others. From that standpoint, he took something that, in our mind, is a tragedy. Turn it into something where we can be helpful and encouraging to uplift others that are going through similar things. Sometimes it's not a reality. Through it all, the peace of God. I've had the peace with God since I got saved. And I've read about and I've taught about the peace of God. But sometimes when certain things hit, instead of being a peace, I will strengthen the inner man. The outward man was a mess. But it gave me an opportunity to teach what these boys would have wanted right now. And that's what they wanted to be heard. Listen to Dad. He's right. Life's short. You don't know. What is going to happen? And that's something that I'll take everywhere for their memory and honor God. Because they're home. And they can't come where I am when they're going for that. That's about it. Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to always open your word. And I know, Lord, that we'd have loved the message that Brother Dez would have brought and pray for him that he'd be strengthened and uh, get through this, whatever he's going through. He would strengthen the inner man. And I know he hates not being here. For the other requests and the other things that are in people's hearts, but I hope that this, in some way, as we went through and showed the, what you've done and what you did for us right as we got saved, and equipped us to deal with the situation and circumstances. We may go through the things, but we just thank you that the ultimate purpose is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and that we're just blessed beyond measure to have the opportunity to serve. Serve it. We thank you for grace. Because grace teaches us how to live. We thank you for each one of us here today. They go forth that they would remember life is short, but a vapor it is for a little while and vanishes away. Let us be about getting the message out, the gospel of those that need it, and help and uh, the, the message of grace and right division. We thank you for it all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.